Hi guys. Hello. Hello. Yes, we're okay. recording. Sorry, I'm so awkward. All right, so the chapter 12 and chapter 16 vocab quizzes are up on Schoology. You can take each of them three times um, and they are due on Thursday. So please have them done by Thursday at six o'clock. Uh, we will take your highest scores, use your book or whatever. Hopefully everybody has 100, um, but use them for practice. The other thing that is also open for you now is the cardiology Schoology exam. So obviously we can't use FISDAP to be testing you. We need to use Schoology and you guys are just going to have to work through it at home. It's fine if you use your book. You have until next Thursday to get that done. You'll only have one attempt. Uh, if you have questions about that, shoot us an email, shoot us a text, um, or if you have trouble accessing it or anything like that. Okay? Okay. Right. Thank you. So today, guys, we're going to talk about shock, chapter 12. Feel free to follow along in your book. Um, we're going to talk about the different types of shock and how we treat them. So again, this is chapter 12, shock in your book. At any point, you can pause the video if you want to catch up, if you want to get a better look at what's going on on the screen. I think we have it set up pretty well so that you guys can see uh, how this looks. Um, if there's any suggestions, you know, feel free to let me know. So shock and the resuscitation of shock. We're going to talk about the causes of shock. We're going to talk about the pathophysiology. Remember that nice word behind shock. We're going to talk about how we as EMTs manage shock. So respiratory failure, respiratory arrest, cardiac failure, cardiac arrest, and then post resuscitation management. So these are some situations where we're going to see shock. So the pathophysiology is our knowledge of why somebody is going into shock and what is going on inside the body when the patient is in shock. We have some cool videos we're going to watch. I'm going to link those videos in Schoology as well. I have a whole playlist from my friends over at the Khan Academy. So hopefully you guys like those videos as well. So shock is a hypoperfusion state. Remember the word hypo, low, perfusion, circulation of blood. So we have a low circulation of blood throughout the body. And this is a description of a state of collapse and failure of the cardiovascular system. So our pump is our heart, our container is our vessels, and our fluid is our blood, as we already know from the heart lecture. And this is how they're all not working correctly together. So in the early stages, the body is always going to attempt to maintain homeostasis. As the shock progresses, blood circulation is going to slow and it's going to eventually cease. So we could see this in both medical and traumatic events, such as a heart attack, anaphylactic reaction, motor vehicle crashes, gunshot wounds. So we could do things for these instant, in these instances. Uh, we could treat an anaphylactic reaction with an EpiPen, and we can treat a gunshot wound with major bleeding with things like a tourniquet. So as EMTs, we respond to different types of emergencies, and we are providing care and transportation of those patients to the emergency room. So we have to constantly uh, be aware of the signs and symptoms of shock. We have to constantly monitor. That's why we're reassessing our patients every five minutes. So when we talk about pathophysiology, we need to talk about the perfusion. Perfusion is a circulation of adequate amount of blood to meet the cell's current needs. So our bodies perfused by our circulatory system. Our organs and our tissues and our cells need to have adequate oxygenation or else we have cellular death. So in cases of poor perfusion like shock, um, the transportation of carbon dioxide out of the tissue is impaired. So then we get a buildup of excess waste products and that starts to cause cellular damage. Shock is referring to a state of collapse and failure of our cardiovascular system, and that's going to lead to inadequate circulation. 
it can be an unseen life threat caused by a medical disorder or a traumatic injury. So we need to be aware. We need to be constantly watching these patients and part of our reassessment and our ongoing assessment. If the conditions causing shock are not promptly addressed, death will soon occur. So the cardiovascular system consists of three parts. Like I said, heart is the pump, pipes are our blood vessels, and the contents, the fluid, is the blood. Here we've seen this one before. Uh, systemic circulation, oxygen comes into the lungs, and I think Joy had you follow the heart, uh, the path of the blood uh, of a blood cell throughout the entire body. She had said that's an excellent way to learn the cardiovascular system, and I could not agree more. It's actually, I think, one of the best ways to learn how the cardiovascular system works. So if you haven't done that yet, I strongly urge you guys to get your books out, take a look at this diagram, and uh, pretend that you are a cell, a blood cell, and you're going to take a trip throughout the entire body. It's a really cool way to kind of see where everything is and where you would go on your little blood cell vacation. So the perfusion triangle, three parts of it, uh, when the patient is in shock, one or more of these three parts is not working correctly. So the heart is failing, the blood vessels is failing, are failing, um, or there's not enough blood, so uh, a fluid problem. So we need to kind of figure out where in this triangle we're having a failure. Blood pressure is the pressure of blood within the vessels at any given time. So we know how to take a blood pressure, right? Systolic is the peak arterial pressure, and our diastolic, our low number, is the pressure when the artery in the arteries when the heart is resting. So we know how to take a blood pressure. I hope everybody's really comfortable with that. I know you guys haven't been able to get this hands-on time, and again, I apologize for that. So we're gonna we'll play catch up and do plenty of blood pressures. Pulse pressure is the difference between the systolic and the diastolic pressure. Pulse pressure signifies the amount of force the heart is generating with each contraction. So a pulse pressure less than 25 millimeters of mercury. Again, millimeters of mercury is the measurement standard in which we're giving uh, our blood pressure number. So 120 over 80, 120, 120 millimeters of mercury, 80 millimeters of mercury. So a pressure less than 25 millimeters of mercury may be seen in patients with shock. So for 120 over 80, we take the difference in those two numbers, and that is the pulse pressure. Can you do the difference between the pulse pressure? What? So that would be 40. 120 and 80, my math is not good. The difference is 40. So that pulse pressure in a normal blood pressure would be 40 millimeters of mercury. I hope everybody gets a good laugh at me. Blood flow through the capillary beds is regulated by capillary sphincters. Under the control of the autonomic nervous system, capillary sphincters respond to other stimuli, heat, cold, and the need for oxygen and waste removal. Just like if you're cold and you squeeze your fingertips, they look white or pale because we have decreased perfusion in that area to keep our body warm. Perfusion requires more than just having a working cardiovascular system. Adequate oxygen exchange in the lungs is necessary. Adequate nutrients in the form of glucose in the blood for energy. And adequate waste removal, primarily through the lungs, are exhalation of carbon dioxide. All of these things need to work together for good perfusion. There are mechanisms in place to help support the respiratory and the cardiovascular systems when the need for perfusion of vital organs is increased. Mechanisms include the autonomic nervous system and hormones. Hormones are triggered when the body senses pressure falling. So blood pressure starts to drop, hormones in our body are, are triggered, and an increase in heart rate is seen, um, a strength in cardiac contraction, so the heart squeezes harder, and peripheral vasoconstriction. So our fingertips, our toes, the blood vessels in our arms and our legs start to constrict, and we shunt blood from our extremities into our core, and it increases the amount of fluid inside of our thorax, our trunk. So together, all of these actions are designed to 
maintain blood pressure, homeostasis, and sustain the perfusion of vital organs. So some of the last places that we lose perfusion is the heart, the brain, the lungs. Very important in perfusion. This is the response that causes all of the signs and symptoms of shock. Increased heart rate, decreased blood pressure, increased respiratory rate. So, what are some causes of shock? When do our patients go into shock? When do we need to be worried about it? Shock can result from bleeding, respiratory failure, acute allergic reactions, and overwhelming infection. Damage occurs because of insufficient perfusion of organs and tissues. Again, here we see it. This is going to be repeated pretty often because it's very important. These are the causes of shock. The pump fails. You see the broken heart. The low fluid volume. We just don't have enough. The heart is trying to pump fluid that's oxygenated blood, and it just can't because we don't have enough. Or we have some sort of a vessel dysfunction like infection, drug overdose, spinal cord injury, or anaphylaxis. Here are the causes of shock again. You'll find this in our book, Table 12.1 in the book. Again, feel free to pause any of these things if you want to read it while it's up on the screen. Cardiogenic shock, let's talk about, we're going to start talking about some of the different types of shock. So the first one we're going to talk about is cardiogenic shock. This is caused by the inadequate function of the heart. The heart is starting to fail. So a major effect that we see is the backup of blood into the lungs. So now you're going to ask yourself, wait, we've heard that one before in airway. What is that called? Congestive heart failure. When the fluid backs up into the lungs and it's building up inside our pulmonary system, we call that pulmonary edema. We may hear that when we listen with a stethoscope, and that symptom that we are hearing is called rails. Very good. Nobody is in this room, but it was still very good. So in cardiogenic shock, edema is the presence of abnormally large amounts of fluid between the cells in the body tissues causing swelling. So if we look at this graph or this uh, image that's up on the screen if you could see that really well again these are all in your book take a gander at it we see where the blood vessels are where the blood cells are traveling uh, and how it should be normally and then when we get fluid into the lungs it fills up our alveoli and with gravity it will it will go to the lowest lying places first so if the patient's lying flat on their back when we sit them up we may expect to hear fluid all along the back side of the lungs. If they're sitting up, which most patients will, um, it will, it will gravitate to the lowest portions of the lungs. Pulmonary edema will lead to impaired respiration, and that's manifested by an increased respiratory rate and those abnormal lung sounds that we talked about. So we're gonna hear those with our stethoscopes. You can go to YouTube and you can, and you can search for abnormal lung sounds um, and you'd probably hear some very good demonstrations of what rails and ronchi will sound like. Cardiogenic shock develops when the heart can't sustain sufficient output to meet the needs of the body. Now we're moving into obstructive shock. Obstructive shock is caused by a mechanical obstruction that prevents the adequate volume of blood from filling the heart's chamber. So the three most common uh, forms of obstructive shock would be a cardiac tamponade, a tension pneumothorax, and a pulmonary embolism. Cardiac tamponade is a collection of fluid between the pericardial sac and the myocardium. So between the sac on the outside of the heart and the actual heart muscle itself. And it becomes large enough to prevent the ventricles from filling up with blood. So there's an increased pressure on the outside of the heart, pushing a collapse, preventing it from contracting and filling with blood. So this can be caused by blunt trauma, penetrating trauma. Signs and symptoms we refer to as the Beck's triad. We're gonna go more into this in detail. Tension pneumothorax is another form of obstructive shock and that's caused by damage to the lung tissue Air is normally held within our lungs, 
and it escapes into the chest cavity. So the lung starts to collapse because the air on the outside, just like with the, with the um, tamponade, is pushing pressure onto the lungs and it is a, preventing the lungs from expanding completely. In a pulmonary embolism, a blood clot blocks the flow of the blood through the pulmonary vessels. If it's a massive pulmonary embolism, this can result in complete backup of blood into the right ventricle, catastrophic obstructive shock, and complete pump failure. These patients do not do well. So now we're going to talk about distributive shock. This results from widespread dilatation of small arterioles and small venules, or both. The circulation of the blood volume pools in the expanded vascular beds. Tissue perfusion decreases. So here we have um, a vessel problem, and then we get a fluid problem as well. So the vessel dysfunction causes pooling of fluid into our extremities, and we don't have enough fluid to circulate throughout the body. So we see increased heart rate, decreased blood pressure, increased respiratory rate. So one of the examples is septic shock. That might be something that you hear pretty frequently, that your patient is septic. This occurs as a result of a severe infection in which toxins are generated by bacteria or infected body tissues. These toxins damage the vessel walls and they cause increased cellular permeability. The vessel walls leak and they're not able to contract very well. So we have widespread dilatation of these vessels in combination with a plasma loss through the vessel walls and this results in shock. So we have a, a big container and not enough fluid. In Neurogenic shock, usually this is the result of a high spinal cord injury. So this includes brain conditions, tumors, pressures on the spinal cord, and spinal bifida. In neurogenic shock, the muscles in the, in the blood vessel walls are cut off from the nerve impulses and that cause them to contract normally. So here we see a normal vessel as opposed to a dilated vessel, dilated vessel. Anaphylactic reactions. So this is something that we can treat with our EpiPens. I've got my EpiPen here, my EpiPen trainer. So with our EpiPens, we can actually treat these types of shock. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. So right now, what is anaphylactic shock? This occurs when a person reacts violently to a substance to which he or she has been sensitized. Sensitization means uh, becoming sensitive to a substance that did not initially cause a reaction. Each subsequent exposure tends to produce a more significant or more severe reaction. So you may get stung by a bee for the first time ever and not have a problem, and the second or subsequent um, exposures to that bee sting will cause an over-exaggerated reaction in the body, and we will call that anaphylaxis. So four categories of exposure include injections, stings, ingestions, and inhalations. Anaphylactic shock develops within minutes or even seconds after exposure to the substance. The second phase of the reaction can occur up to eight hours after the initial reaction. Signs are very distinct. Patients are often cyanotic, the blue discoloration of the skin, um, and that could be a late sign. So here we see distributive shock, the different uh, systems that are affected, the skin, the circulatory system, the respiratory system, and the signs and symptoms that you would experience. So you go ahead and pause this right now and take a gander at that, or you can look at chat, uh, table 12.2 in your book. When we talk about distributive shock, psychogenic shock is another, um, another commonly seen thing. This is caused by a sudden reaction of the nervous system. It produces temporary generalized vascular dilation uh, and results in fainting. So some would call this fainting spells. Uh, I know I've joked about the fainting goats. This is pretty much the same concept. Some causes can be serious and others aren't. This is an unexplained syncope. So a lot of times somebody will call us because they've passed out. We don't know why. 
Um, you might see this if somebody finds out that they've lost a loved one suddenly, they faint. This is a form of psychogenic shock. Uh, it can be life-threatening, um, and it can cause irregular heartbeats and aneurysm. It can also cause injuries as a result of a fall. So when people pass out and they're standing up, they fall down, they hit their head, and now they have a head injury. Non-life-threatening events include the receipt of bad news or experiencing fear or unpleasant sights such as blood. So if you are a frequent receiver of psychogenic shock because you don't like the sight of blood, you're probably going to see some blood going forward when we get back out on the ambulance. One of the more common forms of shock is hypovolemic shock, so low volume. Hypovolemic results in an inadequate amount of fluid or volume in the circulatory system. Uh, hemorrhagic shock causes, non-hemorrhagic shock causes are all reasons that we would see these hypovolemic shocks. So this occurs with severe thermal burns as well. Dehydration. This is the loss of water or fluid from body tissues and this can cause or aggravate shock symptoms in patients. Fluid loss may be a result of severe vomiting or diarrhea. With respiratory insufficiency, a patient with severe chest injury may be unable to breathe in an adequate amount of oxygen. An insufficient concentration of oxygen in the blood can produce a life-threatening situation uh, as rapidly as vascular causes of shock. Anemia is an abnormally low number of red blood cells. Hypoxia occurs because the blood is unable to deliver adequate amounts of oxygen to the tissues. And then as a result, we see cellular death. Certain types of poisoning may also affect the cell's ability to metabolize or carry oxygen. So carbon monoxide poisoning, that's one that we've all heard before. Um, unburned byproducts from fire can cause carbon monoxide from our vehicles can cause carbon monoxide poisoning and our blood has a higher affinity for carbon monoxide than it does for oxygen so let's talk about the progression of shock the stages in the progression of shock include compensated shock that's the early stage when the body can still compensate for the blood loss and then decompensated shock is a late stage when the blood pressure is falling, the heart is having a hard time keeping up, our lung capacity is unable to keep up with the oxygen demands, and we start to see patients lose consciousness or lose their ability to breathe on their own. We must recognize shock and we must treat it early. So here are some signs and symptoms of compensated shock. Pause the video here and take a good look at this or pull up table 12.3 in your book and read these. So you will see these on the tests when we have tests. Um, these are pretty important and I'm going to go over them. Uh, compensated shock, these people will be agitated. They will be extremely anxious and restless. They will have this feeling of impending doom. They know something's not right. Uh, they may have an altered mental status. Their pulse, when you take their pulse, we would call it weak. Uh, thready or rapid or maybe they won't have a pulse here in their radial pulse site at all you won't be able to get one they may have one here and it may be weak but they may not have a radial pulse at this point their skin is going to be clammy and cool their breathing um, will be shallow but also fast they may feel short of breath um, especially if they have some sort of a chest injury their capillary refill, when we go to check it, is going to be longer than two seconds. They will have an increased thirst. Why would they be thirsty? Do they have a lower blood volume and our body's natural reaction to that is to drink, to bring in more fluids. And we'll see a narrowing pulse pressure. So that 120 over 80 may look something like 90 over 80. In decompensated shock, the blood pressure is going to fall significantly. So we'll see a systolic blood pressure of 90 or lower in an adult. They'll start to have labored or irregular breathing patterns. Their skin will go from being slightly pale and clammy to ashen, 
mottled or blue will see the cyanosis in those patients. They may have completely absent peripheral pulses. So you're not be able to get a pulse here, here. You may still have a really weak, if not an absent pulse here. They'll have dull eyes or their eyes will appear sunken because they're significantly dehydrated. And people who are in the decompensated shock state for a longer period of time may be able to report to you that they've had poor urinary output. So some people can be hypovolemic for days and have a poor urinary output as the result. Blood pressure might be the last measurable factor to change in shock. So we are compensating. Our body is going to struggle and it's going to try very, very hard to save itself. We are very good as human beings at saving ourselves. When a drop in blood pressure is evident, the shock um, is very well developed. So by the time we see significant drop, our patient is significantly ill. This is particularly true in infants and children. When a child or an infant goes from compensating to decompensating and there's a major change in their vital signs in their presentation, those patients are very ill and we need to perform interventions very quickly. So we should expect shock in, very, in, in many emergency medical situations. So we can also expect shock in a patient who has any of these following scenarios. Multiple severe fractures, you could lose blood from your bones, abdominal or chest injury, spinal cord injury, any type of severe infection, a major heart attack or anaphylaxis. So what are we talking about now? Severe infections. This is a hot topic with this um, COVID-19. These patients go into um, severe respiratory failure, for lack of a better term. They are uh, highly prone to infection, and as a result, they're dying because they have an increased um, likelihood for infection with the pneumonia. So how do we treat this? We always start with the same thing. So this is nothing new. Scene size up, right? Always be alert to potential hazards for our safety. Remember, if I taught you anything, you're your number one, your partner's your number two, and your patient's your number three. Use your gloves, eye protection for trauma scenes if bleeding is suspected. In all incidents involving violence, we're gonna make sure police are on scene. So scene safe, BSI. And now we perform our primary assessment. So we are doing a rapid exam, determining level of consciousness. We're identifying and managing any life-threatening concerns. And then we're going to determine the priority of our patient and we're going to transport. So we can give high flow oxygen. So here we have our non-rebreather, 15 liters, high flow oxygen. We know how to do that. We'll go over it here in a little bit. For hypoperfusion, we're going to treat those patients aggressively and we're going to provide rapid transport. Um, most of these cases, we're going to need advanced life support. Advanced life support can do a little bit above and beyond what we can do. So we're gonna request them as an additional resource. Forming our general impression, assessing the airway to ensure that it's patent and assess the breathing. What we wanna know is what's the respiratory rate? Is it fast? Um, is it adequate? So we're checking for adequate breathing and we're going to assess the patient's circulatory status. A rapid pulse would suggest compensated shock. In shock or compensated shock, the skin might be cool, clammy, or ashen at this point. So we're going to assess for and identify any life-threatening bleeding, and we're going to treat it as quickly as we can. So in our primary assessment, we're going to determine if the patient's a high priority, if ALS is needed, and if so, what, what facility are we going to transport to? What's best for this patient? Trauma patients with shock or a suspicious mechanism of injury generally should go to a trauma center. So moving into our history taking, pretty simple. We're gonna determine their chief complaint and we're gonna use our sample history, our signs, symptoms, our allergies, our medications, our past medical history, our last oral intake, and the events leading up to what's going on today. If we can't get that from the patient, we get it from a bystander. And while we're doing this and while we're talking about this, feel free to get out your medical assessment form and just follow along because this is going to be uh, a scenario that we might see in our National Registry examination when we have it.
Going into our secondary assessment, we're going to be repeating our primary assessment followed by a focused assessment. So in a life-threatening problems found, we're going to treat it immediately. We're going to obtain a complete set of vital signs and we're going to use our monitoring devices, which for us would be blood pressure, stethoscope, uh, pulse oximeter. In our reassessment, what are we going to reassess? Vital signs, interventions, chief complaints, the ABCs, and the mental status. So I would go and say that we would reassess it probably in this order, ABCs, level of consciousness, vital signs, interventions, chief complaint. We're going to determine what further interventions are needed. Do we need to do more? Is what we have provided for the patient working? Is it adequate still? Have there been any changes as the result of that? What would be a change we would expect to see when we put a patient on oxygen? their pulse ox would possibly come up, their heart rate may go down, their respiratory rate may go down, depending on how sick they are. If we're using a tourniquet to stop bleeding, would we expect to see um, no pulses in the extremity? We would expect to see the blood flow from the wound stopped completely. So all of those things as part of his reassessment. Treat for shock early and aggressively, by providing oxygen and keeping the patient warm. So I'm gonna stop right here with the PowerPoint <clears throat> and I'm going to pull up, if you bear with me here for a minute, from the National Registry, the Bleeding Control and Shock Management Form. So this is a skill station in and of itself that the National Registry is going to teach, uh, test us on. And we can find that by going to the National Registry's website and going to our EMT certification tab scrolling down to the psychomotor exam and scrolling down to bleeding control shock management pull up that document now you can do this at home and you can print it out and you can review it um, this is the flow very quick very easy uh, it's only seven points total takes and verbalizes PPE precaution we apply direct pressure to the wound the examiner will inform you that the wound continues to bleed, so now we apply a tourniquet. We apply our tourniquet. The examiner now informs the candidate that the patient is exhibiting signs and symptoms of hyperperfusion. And we will go over how to apply the tourniquet when we meet back in person, because it's very hard to show you on the video. So now you would properly position the patient, administer high flow oxygen, initiate steps to prevent heat loss from the patient and indicate the need for immediate transportation. So what does that look like? That looks like a blanket. So in the station you need oxygen, you need a tourniquet and you need a blanket. And this just illustrates how important um, keeping your patient warm in these, in these situations are. I'm going to bring the tourniquet over here and I'm going to pull the video up so I can make sure you see it very well. So here we have our tourniquet. and it would go over the arm like this. And I'm using my forearm just as a, an example, but it would go high up on the extremity. So closest to the joint, closest to the trunk. But for demonstration purposes, guys, I'm putting it on my forearm, as you see here. So we put it on, and it goes through this little clasp here, and we make it as tight as possible. And it's got Velcro, so it'll cinch down on itself. And this little piece here is called a windlass. And what we do with the windlass is we crank it. So as we crank and crank and crank and crank, so I don't have to crank too hard on me. We then stick it in here in this little clasp. It's designed to capture the windlass, like so. lock it in place. We can write the time on this. We put the tourniquet on, bleeding stops, 
and we're going to make it very tight. We're going to tighten it all the way down until the bleeding uh, discontinues. And oh no, I put that on pretty tight. I do not have a radial pulse here. So blood flow from this point down is effectively cut off. And it's not comfortable. And I did not tighten it down as much as I can or as much as I should in reality. Um, if this was an emergency, I would have it up higher, obviously. Um, and I would want it down to the point where it's going to be extremely uncomfortable for the patient. So that's the tourniquet. And we will go over these when we meet back in person. There are a variety of different types out there, and that's just one example. So this is the CAT, Combat Action Tourniquet. You may hear that term thrown around. If you're interested in uh, getting one, you can go online. I always recommend to people, if you go to North American Rescue, North American Rescue, uh, maybe .com or just Google North American Rescue, you can get the tourniquets from them. They have a bunch of information on there. They're on YouTube. Uh, but if you buy a tourniquet from them, you're not going to be buying a knockoff. And there are knockoff tourniquets out there. So let's go back to the power. So it is important that we are keeping um, the patient warm and we're providing them with oxygen. So as soon as we recognize shock, we're gonna begin our treatment. We're gonna follow our standard precautions. We're going to control all obvious bleeding with the tourniquets, for example. And we're gonna make sure the patient has an open airway. We know how to do that. We're gonna maintain uh, manual inline stabilization, if necessary, of the spine and check for breathing and pulse. So when we do that, jaw thrust if we suspect a spinal uh, injury. So as soon as we recognize shock, we begin our treatment. Comfort, calm, reassure the patient. Never allow patients to eat or drink anything. They may want to, especially these patients. If we think that there's a spinal immobilization, put them on a backboard. Um, provide the patient with oxygen and monitor their breathing. So we're gonna constantly monitor breathing in these patients. That's very important. As soon as we recognize shock, uh, place a blanket under and over the patient. So we kind of wrap them up like a little human burrito and consider the need for advanced life support. Don't give the patient anything by mouth, no matter how much they want. They may plead, uh, just explain to them that we can't do that. Usually pretty pretty uh, reassurable in those cases. And then we record their vital signs every five minutes throughout the entire treatment and transport. The patients cannot generate the power to pump blood through the circulatory system. So in cardiogenic shock, chronic lung disease will aggravate um, patients who are experiencing cardiogenic shock. And these people should not receive ni uh, nitroglycerin. So they may be having chest pain associated with this. In these cases, when they are hypotensive with chest pain, we should be suspicious of cardiogenic shock. And we do not want to give these people um, nitroglycerin. That's one of the situations where we can uh, do more harm than we can do good. So these patients in cardiogenic shock typically have a low blood pressure, very weak, irregular pulse, cyanosis around the lips and under the fingernails, severe anxiety, feeling of impending doom. These are the patients who will tell you, I'm going to die. When someone tells you that they're going to die, take their word for it. Um, usually, in my experience, in your experience, most patients who say they're going to die usually follow through. Um, and they may be nauseous as well. So what do we do? We place the patient in a position that eases their breathing. Usually that's the sitting upright position. We may have to assist their ventilations, uh, but we have to transport them rapidly. Maybe meet advanced life support and route to the hospital. Either way, we're gonna provide a calm reassurance to the patient um, if we suspect that they're having a problem with their heart. In cardiac tamponade, um, increasing cardiac output is the priority. So we have to apply high flow oxygen. These patients need surgery. We don't do surgery in the ambulance, right? So um, a pericardiocentesis uses a needle to withdraw the blood. That's an advanced skill. It's really rarely performed in the field. I don't know anywhere in the United States off the top of my head. 
where paramedics or anybody is performing pre-hospital pericardial, pericardial synthesis. Be cool, but we don't do it. Tension pneumothorax, high flow oxygen. Chest decompression is required. So ALS can do that, right? As a paramedic, I can go out there and I could shove a big giant needle into somebody's chest to relieve the pressure from the collapsed lung. So ALS is always indicated in these types of complaints, uh, shortness of breath, chest pain, traumatic injury, things like that, where we would suspect um, obstructive shock in the form of a pneumothorax. So go ahead and make sure advanced life support is on the way. In sepsis, hospital management is usually is required. Pre-hospital standards have gotten a little bit higher. From the ALS standpoint, we can treat sepsis a little bit better than we used to be able to treat. So using our standard precautions, give them high flow oxygen. We may need to ventilate these people. We may need to bag, use a bag valve mask to maintain their airway. Um, but they're going to lose heat. So these patients, we need to keep them warm. All shock patients need to be kept warm. Septic patients, um, you might find them to be cold to the touch. We have to warm them up. So it says use sepsis team if available. What that means is around here we have sepsis alerts. Um, I use that term loosely because they're not well established, but we can call ahead to the hospital and let them know that we have a suspected septic patient. So we believe that they have a blood infection that's causing them to be shocky, and we can have the hospital prepared to initiate uh, aggressive treatment for those patients. For neurogenic shock, um, we are, have to be have a high index of suspicion for a spinal cord injury. So we need to use a combination of all of our known supportive measures. These people are gonna have to be in the hospital for a long period of time. So we, we get there and we maintain a proper airway and provide spinal immobilization. Usually in the form with an airway and spinal immobilization, we're doing jaw thrust maneuver. So assisting ventilation is also part of that equation conserve their body heat. Their bodies do not have the ability to keep themselves warm um, and ensure the most effective circulation. These people are rapid transports to the hospital. Anaphylaxis, how are we treating them? We're treating them with um, epinephrine pens. So here we have an epinephrine uh, trainer and I'm going to bring it over there and I'm going to show you guys what this thing looks like. So here we have the epinephrine auto injector. I can't see myself, so I'm just doing this on the cuff. And this is just a trainer, but they work pretty much the same way. I don't have to do it. So step one, pull off the blue safety release. Step two, swing and firmly push the orange tip against the outer thigh so it clicks. Hold on the thigh for 10 seconds to stimulate or simulate, I'm sorry, drug delivery. So I'm going to use my forearm again because it's perfectly, uh, so if we pretend this is my thigh, at this point, if we're using a real EpiPen auto injector, the needle will go into my body and it will deliver the drug. So we wait for our 10 seconds and we take it off. And now this shows us that this is a used EpiPen. So on, this, on the real EpiPen, the needle comes out, and when it's done, it goes back up inside, and it's safe. There's no needle sticking out or anything like that. So we're going to get to use our EpiPen auto injectors in class for training when we come back together and meet. So that's what this is. So, promptly transporting the patient, high flow oxygen and ventilatory assistance is needed. These patients have what kind of breath sounds? Do we know? We would hear strider. So they have closing of the upper airway. So constriction in the upper airways causes a high-pitched expiratory sound. They may also have wheezing in the lung. So ALS is very important. Oxygen, high flow oxygen is very important, as well as administration of the EpiPen. A mild reaction can worsen suddenly. And of note, it is a patient who we've treated who gets better can also worsen again. So uh, keep that in mind. Treating psychogenic shock. So in an uncomplicated case of fainting, once the patient collapses, circulatory to the circulation to the brain restores. So they're up, they pass out, blood starts to flow back to the brain, they're up again. 
Sometimes it happens multiple times. Psychogenic shock can worsen other types of shock. If the patient falls, we need to check them for injuries. And that goes for anybody who faints um, or falls. If the patient reports being unable to walk after a fall, we should suspect some other type of problem. Uh, transport the patient promptly, record all of our observations, and try to learn from bystanders. What happened? What did you see? Uh, we might not be able to get our sample OPQRST out of these patients. So if um, was something going on before they fainted? Was there a fight? Was there a, a, a bad news? Was there some sort of an event that caused them to faint? Have they done this before? And if so, why? So these are all questions that we are able to ask these patients, including how long were they unconscious? Hypovolemic shock. So we need to control all obvious external bleeding. So shut it off. Um, there's blood flow out of the body, we want to keep it in. So we can do that with what? Direct pressure, elevation, um, pressure point, or a tourniquet, as we talked about earlier. Keep the patient warm, recognize internal bleeding, and provide aggressive support. So how do we know if somebody's bleeding internally? They will have the symptoms of hypovolemic shock, um, and in their history, in our history taking, we will find that Maybe they had some sort of an injury to their abdomen, or they have pain in their abdomen, or they have notable bruising uh, to the abdomen or to the anywhere in the body for that matter, and we can suspect internal bleeding. Secure and maintain their airway and provide respiratory support. So these people will pass, can pass out, and they will often pass out. So we need to be suspicious of that. So not keeping them in the upright position, lay them down, let the um, as long as they can tolerate it, and transport them rapidly. Treating respiratory insufficiencies. Again, maintaining and securing an airway is a high priority. Clearing the mouth and of any obstructions is also a high priority in managing the airway. If we need to, we can provide these patients with BVM ventilations um, and or supplemental oxygen. Transport the patient promptly. Again, keep them warm as well. So what about shock in older patients? The EMT, you guys, have to use caution when we're caring for older patients. They have more serious complication than younger patients. Um, and illness isn't just part of their aging process. Everybody can become ill. So many older patients take medications that may mimic or mask uh, the signs of shock. And one that comes to my mind is a beta blocker um, that keeps their heart rate relatively low. So even if they're in a shock state, their heart rate may still be what we would consider normal by the number um, because their medications are masking that. So we need to get a good idea of what medications these patients take and, and have an understanding for what they are. So that kind of concludes the PowerPoint end of this and um, we're just going to go into a little bit of review here. So. I know I always skip this part when we're in the classroom, but I think you know it's a good idea to, to go over it here. So the term shock, most accurately defined as decreased supply of oxygen to the brain, cardiovascular collapse leading to an adequate perfusion, decreased circulation of the blood within the venous circulation, or D, the decreased function of the respiratory system leading to hypoxia. Pause here for a second, come up with your answer. The answer is B, shock or hypoperfusion refers to the state of collapse and failure of the cardiovascular system or any one of its components, which leads to inadequate perfusion of the body's cells and tissues. The term shock is most accurately defined as a decreased supply of oxygen to the brain, and this is just the rationale here for our review. Anaphylactic shock is typically associated with which of the following? The answer is A. Uticaria or hives is typically associated with allergic reactions, mild, moderate, and severe. They are caused by the release of histamines from the immune system. In anaphylactic shock, uticaria is also accompanied by cool, clammy skin, tachycardia, 
severe respiratory distress, and hypotension. We would treat that with the EpiPen. And here is the rationale. Signs of compensated shock include all of the following, except D. In compensated shock, the body is able to maintain perfusion to the vital organs of the body via the autonomic nervous system. Signs include pale, cool, clammy skin, restlessness, or anxiety, a feeling of impending doom, tachycardia. When the body's compensatory mechanism fails, the patient's blood pressure falls. Weak or absent peripheral pulses indicate this. Here is the rationale. When treating a trauma patient who is in shock, lowest priority should be given to. Remember, keyword, lowest priority. C, splinting fractures. Critical interventions for trauma patient in shock include spinal precautions, high flow oxygen, thermal management, rapid transport, and early notification of a trauma center. Splinting fractures should not be performed at the scene if the patient is critically injured. It takes too long and it delays transport. Potential causes for cardiogenic shock include all of the following except severe bacterial infection. Cardiogenic shock is caused by inadequate function of the heart pump or, fa or pump failure when certain limits, the heart can adapt to these problems. If too much muscular damage occurs, however, sometimes, as sometimes happens after a heart attack, the heart no longer functions well. Other causes include disease, injury, and impaired electrical system. So patients who have had heart attacks in the past are at a higher risk because of their heart failure um, for cardiogenic shock. A 60-year-old woman presents with a BP of 80 over 60, a pulse rate of 110 beats per minute, mottled skin, and a temperature of 103.9. She is most likely experiencing If you said septic shock, you would be correct. In septic shock, bacterial toxins damage the blood vessel walls, causing them to leak and rendering them unable to constrict. Widespread dilatation of the vessels in combination with plasma loss through the injured vessel walls result in shock. A high fever commonly accompanies bacterial infection. I'm going to go back to the question, and I want to break it down for you real quick. Uh, when you read this question, as you will see with a lot of different types of um, scenario-based questions, you see a couple of different points. She is most likely experiencing, so that word uh, most is in bold caps so that it draws your attention to it. The other thing is the temperature. So that's something you want to look at. Obviously, if you look at the blood pressure and you look at the heart rate and you look at the mottled skin, those are all signs of shock. But what differentiates septic shock from all of those other types of, all of those other answers is the temperature. So in septic shock, you're going to see a fever because of the bacterial infection. So the fever by itself is, is screaming sepsis. So we want to be aware of that. A patient with neurogenic shock would be least likely to present with. C. In neurogenic shock, the nerves that control the sympathetic nervous system are compromised. The nervous system is responsible for secreting the hormones epinephrine and norepinephrine, which increase the patient's heart rate, constrict the peripheral vasculature, and shunt the blood to the body's vital organs. Without the release of these hormones, a compensatory effects of tachycardia and perif peripheral vasoconstriction are absent. A 20-year-old man was kicked numerous times in the abdomen during an assault. His abdomen is rigid and tender. His heart rate is 120 beats per minute. And his respiratory rate is 30 breaths per minute. You should treat this patient for... 
D, hypovolemic shock. The patient may have a liver laceration or a ruptured spleen, both of which can cause internal blood loss. However, it's far more important to recognize that the patient is hypovolemic shock and treat him accordingly. So let's look at the, the rationale a little closer here. Could be a lacerated liver and it could be a ruptured spleen. We don't know. That's the point. Uh, we can't diagnose that and we can't necessarily treat those things specifically, but we can treat the symptoms of hypovolemic shock associated with both a lacerated liver and a ruptured spleen. And as far as respiratory failure, if we treat the hypovolemic sh volemic shock, then we will subsequently also treat the respiratory compromise. So the correct answer is hypovolemic shock. A 33-year-old woman presents with a generalized rash, facial swelling, and hypotension approximately 10 minutes after being stung by a hornet. Her BP is 70 over 50. Her heart rate is 120. In addition to high flow oxygen, this patient is in most immediate need of epinephrine. The patient is in anaphylactic shock, a life-threatening over-exaggeration of the immune system that results in the bronchoconstriction and hypotension. So after ensuring adequate oxygenation and ventilation, the most important treatment for this patient is epinephrine, which dilates the bronchioles, constricts the vasculature, and it improves breathing and blood pressure respectively. So guys, that sums up our chapter 12 lecture. Thank you, Jen. So going forward, what are we doing? Like Jen said, we have our chapter 16 and chapter 12 vocab quizzes up for you guys. Um, I believe it's set up for unlimited practice attempts, so go have at it. Look at the practice, look at the practice uh, quizzes. There should be three attempts on there. I'm sorry, I misspoke. And um, you can go ahead and work on those things. And then going forward, the due date for our cardio cardiology schoology exam is Monday night, by Monday night, right? A week from today, Monday night at 6 o'clock, it closes. It cl the test will close Monday night, um, March, 30th. March 30th at 6 p.m. So if we come into Schoology and we go into EMT program, master template under exams, I believe that's under exams, and we click on cardiology exams, cardiology unit exam from now until three thirty at six PM you may take this test one time. So that's all we have for tonight. I would direct you guys to go over to the National Registry's website. As soon as you get to their homepage, nremt.org, what you'll find is uh, on the banner here across the top, one of the first things that it will scroll to is COVID-19. And if you click on that, it will pull up the COVID-19 National EMS certification information. So what does this mean? This is updated regularly. Um, this is where we're getting our information as well as from the state um, EMS office. So as of right now, the state EMS office is kind of mirroring what the National Registry is saying, but we hope to have better guidance by the end of this week. Um, going forward, we do not have a date even a soft date um, where we think we're going to be able to come back. So right now the way we're doing this is the way that it's going to be going forward for an unknown period of time. If any of you guys have any specific questions, feel free to shoot us one of, a, uh, one of us a message, however you wanna do that. Okay, thank you very much for watching.